Well, good morning. Welcome to our fourth and our final week in our series, our current series that we're calling Known, right? So to briefly recap, I want to begin by exploring how we are perfectly and intimately known by God, the very creator of the universe. He knows us so well, in fact, that he knows how we were created, and he knows better than anyone else that we were made for discipleship, that we were made for relationship and fellowship. So today, as we come together for our final word in this series, let's begin first with a word of prayer. Let's please pray. God, give us a heart like yours for other people. We know, Lord, that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Empower and embolden us as we invite others to your table, to the banquet of the Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. So as we discussed last week, many of us struggle to have deep and meaningful relationships with other people. Maybe it has to do with the overly connected and yet disconnected world in which we live in. For many of us, we tend to collect friends on Facebook and followers on Instagram and X. And maybe you thought at some point, you know, how many Facebook friends should I have? What's the average? Well, according to the Pew Research in, 20, uh, in, in 2023, that number is 229 friends. So you should have 229 Facebook friends. That's the average. If anything less than that, and well, you're just not very liked, are you? <laughs> they also noted that 80% of friend requests are accepted. And then over on Instagram, the average would be that 74% of all users have less than 1,000 followers. They tend to count in bigger numbers, I guess, or they're padding it, whatever. On X, it's 500. And the goal that they say everybody on LinkedIn, the goal is to develop 500 or more connections. Then you've truly networked. So from one perspective, we've never been more connected, and yet 52% of Americans feel lonely. 12 to 30% of people do not report that they have any close friendships. So while we report that we are maintaining these larger numbers of social media connections, we're often not experiencing any meaningful real-world connections. We are a society that has become more and more anxious, lonely, and isolated. But with Jesus, we become truly known, deep to the core of who we are kind of known. And then through this very real and this very deep connection with God, we're called to have deep, real connections with a whole new group of people, the church, the sacred gathering. We're part of this new family with new brothers and new sisters. And this gives us a, a sense that we're connected to people all over the world. Maybe it's us, maybe it's others. Either way, something amazing happens when we give our life to Christ. He literally takes us as 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5 says, and he builds us into this spiritual house, the ecclesia, the congregation, the sacred gathering. And amazingly, our once isolated lives become embedded into the greater family of Christ. And instantaneously, just like that, we gain new brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers in the faith all over the world. And it's through Christ that we learn to grow in relationship and fellowship. And we find ourselves both known by and knowing others. And frankly, it's, it's fantastic. Six years ago, six years Lisa and I have been here in this sacred gathering with all of you. I as your pastor and Lisa, my wife. And we've gotten to know many of you and we've fallen in love with you. We have fallen in love with this church. And we have a sense of belonging here. This is a special place, isn't it? For many of you, you have bonded over the years through knowing and being known <clears throat> by each other in this special place. And in this place, you've also come to be better known by God, too. And this feeling of being known, it's a wonderful feeling. It's actually so wonderful, it's worth sharing, right? Again and again and again. If given the opportunity... Would you share this with anyone who will listen? It's not just about being part of a sacred gathering, our lighthouse, right? 
but it's about sharing with others this opportunity to know and be known by the God of the universe, by his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, that is the plan that we're going to be exploring today. As believers who have freely received grace and mercy and redemption and more, we are then called to freely give it all away to others. And we do this by sharing the kingdom. Sharing the kingdom. It's what we do. It's who we are. Our main passage for the day comes from the book of Ephesians, and it talks powerfully about this togetherness of our faith. So if you're able to stand for the reading of Scripture, now's the time to do so. Our passage is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. <clears throat> so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Together, we are his house. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. And through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to be God. You may be seated. So if this sounds a lot like our passage from last week, it's because it is. In fact, both Paul, the author of this passage, and Peter that we looked at last week, describe how the people of God are being built up together into a dwelling place, a spiritual home. We call it the church, right? And I love that Paul adds into this passage this idea that when you come to faith in Jesus, you're no longer foreigners, you're no longer strangers, or said another way, you're no longer unknown and far away from fellowship. Rather, you are fully known and fully immersed into the family of faith. Let me say that last part again. In Christ, you are fully known and fully immersed into the family of faith. Paul says it so perfectly when he calls us fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. So we become fellow citizens, right? That's something, it's amazing to be part of a family about being known. There's something amazing about that. Being wanted and loved. Listen to this story. Rubel Shelley tells of his friend Rich and Patty White, who traveled to a third world country to adopt a little girl named Olana. After two years of effort and paperwork, the Whites stood before a judge in that country who read the words from an official pronouncement, and this is what it said. It's harsh. Listen. And as much as Olana Morgan is orphaned and unwanted by any family in this country, and as much as no citizen of this country wishes to have Alana Morgan, and then he went on, right? When this, when this recitation concluded, it gave the whites custody of Alana, this loving couple who dropped to their knees and hugged their new daughter and promised you will never have to hear the word unwanted spoken over you again. Many of us can relate to this story because we felt at times in our lives just like this orphan girl did right? Unwanted, alone, unloved. Those are horrible words for any person, child or adult, to have spoken over their lives. Thankfully, the adoptive couple in the story gives the perfect example of how Christ responds to all of those who come to him. Being fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household means that you'll never have to hear the word unwanted spoken over you again. In fact, God wanted you so badly, he sent his only son to trade his life for your life, for my life, for all of our lives. So instead of hearing the words unwanted, alone, or unloved, we hear the words wonderful, marvelous, beautiful. That's right. That's right. All the way back, right, to the beginning of our series. Do you remember? Say these words with me if you remember. Wonderful. Oh, you have to do better than that. It's Pastor Appreciation Day. You've got to make it sound like I'm doing a good job here, right? So, wonderful. wonderful. That's better. Marvelous. Marvelous. Beautiful. Beautiful. Aren't those better words? We already talked a ton last week about the power and the possibility of, you know, kingdom connections in our lives. So I'm not going to keep harping on that point today. Instead, I want to turn our attention outward, right, and consider what it would look like 
to invite others into this family? What would it look like to extend the invitation to other potential fellow citizens, right? To speak the word wanted over those outside of these walls who maybe have only heard the words unwanted. As I mentioned earlier, sharing the kingdom, it's what we do. It's who we are. And one of the reasons I can make such a definitive statement is because Jesus so clearly gives us this beautiful picture in the New Testament. And my favorite picture for this sharing with others is found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, which is usually called the parable of the wedding banquet. Let's read this. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, the feast has been prepared. The bulls and the fatted calves have been killed and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But his guests, the guests that he invited, ignored them. And they went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized the messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious. And he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. And the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone that they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for the wedding, and he said, friend, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and his feet and throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Okay, so at the beginning of this parable, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. Now the illustration, it describes how the original invitations, they were rejected, and the king eventually instructs his servants to go and invite anyone that they can find to the banquet. I love how Jesus makes the point of saying that the banquet is ready which invokes in my mind like images of, you know, warm food and all kinds of appetizers and, 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 and side dishes, kind of like if you've ever been on a cruise. Raise your hand if you've been on cruises. I know you guys have gone on cruises, right? So if you go on a cruise, there's like the buffet night, right? And then they lay this spread out and, they, and they, they build like animals out of fruit and they do all these carvings and there's like cheese sculptures and it's nuts right but that's the picture I get in my mind of this right this elaborate feast that's fit for a king just waiting for folks to come and enjoy it and for most of us the family table in our house is the place where we spend time with one another. It's the place where friendships are formed. It's the place where old friendships are continued. It's a place where both difficult and encouraging conversations take place. Essentially, the table is the place where relationships develop and grow. It's the picture of shared fellowship with others, the table, right? Table fellowship. It's a place where we both get to know other people and we are, allow ourselves to be known. And for the life of me, I just can't imagine that any one of us here today wouldn't want to share such an amazing and special place with others. I know it's hard. I know it can be costly. I know it takes a lot of energy. But like Jesus said, the banquet is ready. Eventually, all of the seats at the table will be filled and the king will order that the banquet hall doors are closed so it's important for us to invite as many people as we can for as long as we can to join in the fellowship. Because as long as Jesus is still building his church, there's still room for more fellow citizens at the table. But it's no secret that having healthy relationships with others, it takes time and energy. It's the reason some of us have chosen to abandon the pursuit altogether and live isolated lives devoid of connection and intimacy trading real relationships 
for Facebook friends and Instagram followers and likes. You know, social media companies, they're constantly pushing us into a virtual world with virtual experiences. Places where there's a perception of real connection, which in reality is no connection at all. But these virtual relationships, they can be as deep and real as in-person relationships from time to time. On the negative side is a new and disturbing trend called online or virtual affairs. This is where two people have an intimate, sometimes sexual and secret relationship while they're married to somebody else. But it's all taking place on computer. There are so many different ways for people to connect online and, and, and to begin to have a friendship or a relationship that seems innocent at first but turns more sinful later. There's even a website out there that's promoting having online extramarital affairs. It's bad. But when we isolate ourselves from real in-person connection and relationship, we open up ourselves to a distorted and corrupted version that's spawned by hell itself. But as I said in week one, we were made for more than relational dissonance. We were made in the image of the triune God for community and fellowship and kingdom-centered connectedness. And, and this is where we're most fully known, by God first and then by others. Galatians chapter 6 says, so let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we will, release, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. So, <clears throat> if anyone could speak about becoming weary, it should be Paul, the Apostle Paul, right? I mean, he was beaten and shipwrecked and stoned and mocked and imprisoned, all, all for the sake of sharing the gospel message with other people. And yet he still encourages all of us to do good for people as long as we can, at every opportunity. But don't give up, he says. It takes time and effort and energy to make friendships. And you need to be in the lives of people in order to have an impact on them for Jesus Christ. Random witnessing to others, it's not nearly as effective as the steady, consistent, caring Christian that an unbeliever knows. The person who cares and checks in on them when they got some bad medical news. The young Christian woman who will look in on a young mother next door and maybe help with the kids. Look for opportunities to care and demonstrate love. Don't give up. Don't grow tired of what's doing, of doing good. You know, we are built sometimes to take the path of least resistance, right? Well, I could go and I could, I could share with my friend and invite them to church, but they might think I'm weird. And I don't, I don't know, it's just a lot, and I don't want to bother with that. So I'm just going to watch another show or spend another hour scrolling on Instagram. Don't grow tired of doing good. I would say it again, as long as Jesus is still building his church, there's still room for more fellow citizens at the table. So go out there and invite them. What could be better than inviting people to the banquet table of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? So, anyway, as our time in this series draws to a close, I want to briefly walk you back through some of the highlights and the main points. First and foremost, your relationship with God and being in that right relationship with Him is the most important point to remember. If there's something that is holding you back, some offense that is keeping you at arm's length or unforgiveness or, or repetitive sin, whatever it may be, that is where you need to start. That's your starting place. That is the most important relationship of all of the relationships that you will ever have. And it is through God and that deep fellowship that intimacy and understanding and all of that can be found. So as you grow in your relationship with God, as you come to know him, it's important that you learn to trust him. You need to learn to put your trust in God. Proverbs 19 verse 21 says, many are the plans in the minds of a man, but it's the Lord's purpose that will stand. So it's best to learn to quickly trust and obey. In fact, Jesus goes so far as to say, if you love me, then keep my commandments, right? So that's our part. But God knows you. 
and he knows what's best for you. So included in the list of what is best for you and what is most fulfilling and most healthy is being a part of a fellowship of believers like here at Lighthouse. This is, is where you're able to, to know and be known by others in a Christ-centered atmosphere. Will it be hard? Yeah, of course. But will it be worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely, 100% yes. With Christ at the center, we know that he builds his church according to the very will of God. And that is the kind of building project that we should want to be a part of. And finally, we need to be intentional about inviting others to the kingdom table. Invite as many as you can to the great banquet of the King of Kings. The food's hot, the settings are all in place, and there's still plenty of open seating. Lots of reservations on, re on open table, right? So the table is where relationships develop, not on the computer screen. And it's where, it's where we turn away from the disconnected dissonance that the world offers and drink deeply of the divine fellowship with others and the other fellow citizens in, in Christ's kingdom. This is where we are most fully known, right? So we've been given this kingdom, adopted into the family of faith, and what could be better than inviting others to be a part of it too. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Let us not grow tired of doing what is good. Let us not give up, Lord. Let us answer the call, that little nudge that you put on our hearts from time to time to speak to somebody, to invite them to church, to say, hey, let's just get some coffee and talk. Help us to be the consistent Christian friend to those who still need to come to your table. Provide us, Lord, with the opportunities and the awareness to invite others. And Lord, if there's anybody here today that needs to take care of their relationship with you, we pray that you would give them the, the time to do that. Lord, help us to remove any obstacle in our way of being more fully known by you. And Lord, take away any fear, any anxiety that we might have about sharing the gospel with other people and just go for it. We have the truth, we have your love, we have your mercy. Let's give it away. Let's share it with other people. Not so that we can grow Lighthouse, Lord, but so that we can grow your kingdom so that you would receive all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. Help us, Lord, to do that, to be known in the real. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.